I'm joined by Greg Thompson of Cover One to talk about the biggest storylines for the Buffalo Bills entering the season today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Friday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day. And as a reminder to you, we are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. It's Bet Online, and it's where the game starts. Well, folks, if you're joining us on YouTube, there's no surprise. There he is. It's Greg Tomset. Cover one. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be joined by Greg. And today on the podcast, I just want to talk to Greg about the stuff that we're all thinking about. The season is less than a week at a week away. You've heard from me for months. I can't even remember the last time I had a, a Bill-specific guest on. It's been just a real grind of a lot of reactions to what's going on. And I feel like it's a good opportunity here to bring in another voice and a guy's I got here in Greg Tomset, whose voice I, I really enjoy listening to because he's a smart Bills guy. I learn things when I talk to Greg, and that's what I love about our conversations, not just about the Bills, but uh, Greg's also my go-to when I need to pick out a new bedroom set for my daughter and what <laughs> mattress uh, to get her. So, Greg, thanks for uh, coming on here and, and always for uh, being willing to chat with me. Yeah, dad life is a good life. Yeah, I'm glad you've been through it. So that way uh, you save me some from some pitfalls. But uh, as much as people may love for us to sit here and talk about uh, what mattress you should buy for your two and a half year old when they transition from a crib to a big girl bed, we're going to talk about the Buffalo Bills and Greg expectations, right? That That's that's to me when I think about the Bills, the 2022 NFL season, it's expectations. And this team is the favorite to win the Super Bowl. And I don't know. Like, I don't feel like that's all that different than last year. And obviously they fell short of meeting those expectations. But as you do consider the 2022 version of the Buffalo Bills, where do you find confidence in believing that they can do it this year? So obviously some of it's very simple answers. You know, it, it's crazy not to simply look at the talent. The talent is very real. It's not theoretical talent. It's not, oh, I hope they can come together plenty of these pieces we've seen perform at an incredibly high level together in Buffalo on this team. So some of that, there, there should be an incredibly high baseline of expectation that we know what they're capable of. We've seen it. We, we've literally seen them perform at a high level. There's some other things outside of there that I like in a couple different directions in that I like that there wasn't complacency that there was a desire to get better, that there wasn't this, well, we were really good. Let's just kind of keep it all together and just try again. There was a realization about, hey, we, we need more closers on defense. And you saw them revamp, you know, literally more than half the defensive line. Um, that, hey, we know we need some differences in our approach to protection and how we're going to set up a run game and have some some uh, differences there. So being able to go through those things and then some not by choice, being able to have a new play caller and things like that. Um, I like that there was investment in the, in the ways they did that. And then the last one I liked was they're not pretending that the expectations aren't there. Like sometimes you'll hear them you know, cower behind that. Well, you know, that's all media talk. We're not, you know, we're not going to talk about here. We're only going to talk about the next game. I love that they're embracing the fact and saying that, you know, expectations are a blessing. Expectations mean that we are capable of these things. They're saying outright, our goal is a championship. We know this is a Super Bowl caliber team. They're saying we haven't done it yet. We still have to prove that. We still have to go game by game. But I like that they're not hiding behind that and pretending like they don't know that they're good. Um, so I think that also speaks to a calm confidence they have as well. What did Brandon Bean say in his press conference on Thursday morning? He said, it's not 2018, right? It's, it's not 2018. This is a different ball game. And you've heard even Sean McDermott say things like, you know, this is where we wanted to be at this point, right? So you kind of embrace it. And obviously they understand that you got to go do it and nothing's handed to anybody. But uh, 
there definitely does seem to be that awareness. And I, I like that you brought up awareness, right? Like you said, they knew they needed to do some things to help get over that hump. And obviously revamping the D-line, a different approach to running the football. Are there any boxes they didn't check, Greg? Like, is there anything that's lingering for you that when you think about the 2021 team and let's face it, I mean, a capable team of winning the Super Bowl. Like, I, I think if they manage the end of that Chiefs game, they do it. But so, outside of that, I mean, like, is there anything that's lingering for you in your mind? So, yeah, Aaron and I spend a lot of time on our show talking about the fact that there are no perfect rosters in the NFL. There's no team with no holes that um, we use your phrase. We, we reference your your line about, you know, always watch other teams with the same critical eye that you watch the Bills. We're always very specific and will nitpick oh hey yeah but what about this so of course you know knowing now the timeline for trey white and the fact that you know he you know is in the position that he's in maybe we could have brought in more on the uh veteran cornerback front but honestly it kind of seems like we did well in the draft and having the the depth of benford and that elam has looked good like i, I think that benford looking really good has made people translate that, oh, Elam must be struggling. I, I think mm. he's looked pretty good too. Like, I think it's been a, a both positive and that, oh, Benford just exceeded his expectations by so much that it's a story. Um, so there's little pockets there that I, I'd probably feel better if we had also invested in a, a veteran cornerback. Um, I like where the offensive line's headed, but there's still questions. You know, there's still things that could be there. So um, whether it's Questenberry or Spencer Brown at right tackle, I still have some question there um so i like it that each of the areas that there are question marks it's a capable guy last year plus a nice free agent or a first round pick and another player it's mm -hmm. it's investment in those spots but i think those are the areas that um you know in hindsight maybe we could have gone a little different direction but it would have been uh obviously we're almost out of money now so <laughs> there's that much else they could have done yeah i, I think it's a, a good reference there i like that how you mentioned that they have some hedges built in but you know one thing that i've talked a lot about this offseason is scheme evolution and how some of the personnel moves that they made whether that's a james cook in the passing game or a, a more athletic offensive line i mean it just it's insane when you consider the caliber of athletes that started for the bills last year's primary starters to what they have this year you're just talking about a whole lot more athleticism which then is an indicator that you're going to have an identity as a run offense and more lateral mobility and guys that aren't going to constipate your, your blocking efforts. And then defensively uh, introducing, you know, potentially more depth at linebacker and Terrell Bernard and having more variety of skill sets up front with your defensive line. And I think scheme evolution is something that for me, I, I'm really excited about this year as a way that can help them to get over the hump outside of just, you know, they got Von Miller or it's Josh Allen's really, really good. So, and and I, I've obviously spent a lot of time talking about the story of this team and what they've been through over the last three years. Like, I don't know that we, we take enough time to say, wow, this team had two playoff exits due to an overtime loss. And the other time that they ended their season, it was the AFC championship game, right? Like there's, they've, they paid their dues, Greg. You know, like, I think that matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's yeah, like anything else. They still have to finish. They still have to yeah. do it. But the fact that they've now positioned themselves, weren't complacent, took that step forward. Now it's time to capitalize. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your pro and college football betting needs and sports information this season. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week's games, Bills, Rams. You guys know about that. That's coming up. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. It's Bet Online, and it's where the game starts. So, Greg, I want to talk offense. I want to talk defense, but I want to talk about you. I mean, you're one of the my favorite uh, Bills content creators, personalities out there. You're a great follow on social media. You have a great podcast. So before we get any further here, let's uh, let's take the opportunity now. I think sometimes we wait to the end to get to this, and I want to make sure we give 
you know, the listeners an opportunity if, in, for, if for some reason they're not familiar with you and your work where they can keep up. I appreciate it very much. Uh, we love everybody who listens to Lockdown Bills. Uh, Aaron and I are avid listeners ourselves uh, and, and enjoy it very much. You can come over, find uh, Aaron Quinn and I hosting the Cover One Buffalo podcast, our previews on Wednesday nights, and then immediately following every game is our favorite show, our immediate live game, post game show. Uh, you can find it on uh, YouTube Live right here. If you're watching the show, you can find it in the same place. Just search for Cover One. Uh, and a fun thing for everybody listening on Friday morning, on Friday night, uh, we're actually meeting up, Aaron and I, with Tim Graham at uh, Uncle Jumbo's tasting room to do a live show Q and A with some fans and have mm -hmm. fun there uh, in Buffalo to get ready for the the season. So if you're listening to this today, uh, later on tonight we'll be there on Elmwood at uh, Uncle Jumbo's tasting room with me and Aaron and a handful of other folks. And Tim Graham joined us. Gonna have a good time. Well, I wish I was there. That sounds yeah, like a good, good time. Fun. I like I like hanging out with Tim. I uh, I spent a night with Tim Graham at the uh, NFL Scouting Combine one night, nice. and uh, you know I'm not I'm not I'm not one to to, to see the wee hours of the morning, but I did. I did that time. So I'm sure you guys are in for a great night. And man, I do love that post game show. I've told you before, like that's a big part of my process because I, I, I typically go watch the game at my brother's house and then I drive back home and it's a 45 minute drive. And so I'm, I got you and AQ on and it helps me relive a lot of it. You know, and I, I think you guys are crazy for doing it live. I think you guys are crazy for doing it right after the game, but damn, I'm happy you do it because uh, it's a great reinforcement for me and my process. So thanks for what you do there. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's my favorite thing. It's my favorite thing. I love it. And yeah, so it's some some days are better than others, but it's uh we have a good time with it. I, I guess the only and this just hit me. This just hit me. Because I'm driving and I'm a safe driver, I'm not involved with the chat. I'm just listening to you. Mm. I bet you that chat is insane. <laughs> it's in both directions. It's awesome in great wins it is amazing yeah. like it's really really cool uh people like everyone's so pumped and excited and it is horrifying in bad <laughs> losses it is so so right because you know in the same reaction that you have everyone normally has the same comments for oh my gosh how do you guys do it immediately after tough losses and we talk about it that it's kind of cathartic in the way that it's how mm -hmm. we process it and we know we have to get ready for the show and talking through it helps and by the end of the show we feel better about the situation that we're in <laughs> Um, I can tell you, everyone in the chat is not always in that same mindset of, of how how they're feeling. So, uh, it's uh, yeah, it, it's a process. It's a process. That was 2020. You only had three losses. That was fun, right? Yeah, but that was six so, of that them was last lovely. year. Lovely Jacksonville game. Oof. Um, why do I keep bringing that up? I, I got to forget that. I got, I got, it's because I watched it recently. I had to do a roster yeah. presentation for the um the draft network on the Jaguars. So I watched the Bills game, and I wish I didn't. I wish I didn't, Greg. When we talk about expectations, that comes up a lot in that yeah. that's the if we want to do what we want to accomplish, maybe the overtime situation doesn't happen if that game's in Buffalo. May, yeah. You know, may, those little the the foot slip with Tennessee, the you know, those kind of games, mm -hmm. they can't afford to have those. So I, I think that it's OK to point to it. It doesn't have to be a, a horrible negative thing. It just needs to be that reminder of you have to be ready every single week. You can't walk out and just be entitled. So Thursday, Bills, Rams, uh, what is that, an eight-something kick on the East Coast. Yeah. UNAQ, where you're going live, what, midnight, 1130, whenever that – yeah, I, I can't lie. It was a lot easier to do these when nobody wanted to watch the Bills <laughs> and all the games were at 1 o'clock on Sunday and our show was at like 4.15 on Sunday and I'm done at 5.15 and eating dinner with my family. Now that half our games are some mm -hmm. major primetime game that I don't go live until like 11.30 or 11.45 starting the show and we go until almost, you know, by the time I'm done with the post-show production, 1 o'clock, 1.30. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's great. I'm really glad the team's good. I just, I, I don't love it that now the NFL wants to show everybody our team. I liked it better when we were at one o'clock. <laughs> I hear that. Um, I'm, I'm up late too. And I guess that's probably the benefit of going live is you don't have to sit there and plan out your show. You just do it. So <laughs> press record. Let's talk about the bills offense. Greg, what's on your mind? What's the prevailing thought when you think about the bills offense in 2022? What does Greg Thompson think about? I, I love your term scheme evolution. I, I think that's a, a really smart way to approach it in that it's a constant debate in our cover one Slack chat or our cover one like staff chat, um, which I love. We have some really smart guys uh, on our team and, and we, we get into some heated debates on things. And we keep wondering about, you know, is there really going to be more 12 personnel? How are they going to fit in the James Cook uh, receiving back role? What are they going to do? What if they want to have, um, 
Jamison Crowder and Isaiah McKenzie on the field at the same time. Are we going to see more 10? Um, what is that extension for Reggie Gilliam? mean, you know, are we going to see a little bit more of him? Um, I almost, I haven't said this on any show yet because I haven't done a show since uh, the the news and the uh, releases came. Um, I actually think the OJ Howard release is a sneaky boost for Reggie Gilliam that no one's talking about. Everyone's talking about uh, Quentin Morris and Tommy Sweeney. I almost wonder if we're going to see more snaps for Reggie Gilliam than people are, are recognizing and that maybe there's still on paper, it'll look like 21 personnel, but really it's kind of 12 the way they use Gilliam. So there's some things there that I'm curious about because all those different things are going to be in my mind, minor shifts. Is it, do we go from the least 12 personnel in the league at like <laughs> eight or 9% to 15%? You know, we're not all of a sudden going to be the Ravens or the Browns like the, who are 50% 12 personnel. Um, this is an 11 personnel team. It's going to be Diggs, Davis, McKenzie, and, Daw and Dawson Knox, you know, 80 plus percent of the time in some combination. And it's going to be driven through Josh Allen in the passing game. And I think all the other pieces are honestly window dressing and smoke and mirrors to get defenses not to only pay attention to the fastball because that fastball is really freaking good. So I I don't want to see Ken Dorsey shift all that much. I don't want to see a big shift. I want to be more effective running the ball. I don't want to run the ball more often. I want to keep being really, really good at what we're really, really good at. Um, so I hope that we see some interesting tweaks. I hope we see some smoke and mirrors that can be eye candy for the defense and keep them on their toes. But I hope we keep just chucking the ball and putting it in Josh's hands because I think that's our path to winning. Is there reason to believe that it won't be that way? Like, are there indicators to you that gives you concern that all of a sudden, <laughs> and I know this for some teams, this might sound good, but for us, they become more balanced? Like, is there a reason you think that'll happen? No, there isn't. But I've heard people wonder, oh, did Sean McDermott handpick a first-time coordinator mm. that he promoted so that he could have more control? Kind of, almost implying that he personally wants more run plays, even though he was, was the head coach the entire time that we were lead. Like, it's not like Brian Dable handcuffed him and like ran away. Ha ha ha. I'm going to call pass plays and you can't stop me. Mm -hmm. Like he's been the head coach while we've been the past heaviest team in the NFL. So I don't think so. I don't think that there's any like secret narrative that Sean McDermott's trying to force them to do that. He wants to be good at things when we do them, that he's right to have been frustrated that our run game wasn't effective. I don't think he ever wanted to run the ball more. So mm -hmm. I'm not expecting that, but I've heard people wonder that. And it's not crazy. Like I, I can see where they're coming from, uh, but I don't expect there to be some shift back towards it other than maybe we're blowing teams out so much that we have more sure. four minute offense. I'll, I'll take sure. some of that. Yeah. Uh, uh, was there was that like happened one game. Was it the Pittsburgh game where Zach Moss like took over? You're like, wow. Four minute offense is really cool when it actually works. Yeah. Like you don't give them the ball back and you just take their will, you snatch their soul at the end of the game. Like I would love to see more of that. There was what we had one of them, maybe a Jets game or one of the Jets games that was closer than it should have been, where we took the ball and I think it was like the last seven minutes. It was like a seven minute drive just to like, nope, sorry, you're done. We we have the ball now. Bro, <laughs> those are my favorite moments. Those are those are awesome. Um let me ask you a question about something that's been on my mind, and it is this running back trio, Devin Singletary, James Cook, Zach Moss. We've never seen the Bills effectively get two running backs going with any level of consistency, much less three, especially now that you're talking about three here in Singletary, Moss, and Cook, where I don't think any of them can play a lick of special teams. Maybe James Cook is a kick returner, but we're talking covering – kicks and punts, blocking for kicks and punts. Like, they don't bring anything there. What is your expectation for how this running back room, like, actually plays out this year in terms of utilization? Talk about one of the most heated debates in our Cover One staff oh, good. chat. Um, there are people that I respect who strongly believe it's Singletary between the 20s, Cook in the passing game, Moss is a short yardage guy every single game, all season long. 
it's not crazy. We we saw some of that. I mean, every time we had a short yardage opportunity in preseason, mm -hmm. it was extra offensive linemen, either Brown or Questenberry coming in, two tight ends, Reggie Gilliam and Zach Moss. Every single time they converted, I think I, I think they had seven attempts and it was three touchdowns or three first downs. Mm. So that's some reinforcement that like, hey, maybe if we go in and you add a sixth lineman like David Questenberry, who's a road grading run blocker and you have more two tight end sets and you have Reggie Gilliam, who's a good fullback and you want a short yardage back, that's a thing. We also saw one game all of last year where they had three running backs active. And that game was the only game that Reggie Gilliam was inactive for. Mm -hmm. So we did see uh, Matt Breida come up in other years, TJ Yeldon. It was never as a third running back. It was always because Singletary mm -hmm. or Moss were out. So assuming that we now shift to where it is in every game, three-headed running back, that means there's a position that's been game day active somewhere else every single week who is now inactive, who you just brought up the key point, is not a special teams contributor. So who are you sitting? What depth linebacker or corner or safety or Jake Kumaro type wide receiver are you sitting that is was playing special teams for a guy who doesn't? So I do concede that I saw enough in the preseason that I can't I can't just call those people crazy and say it's not going to happen. It clearly could. I don't know where it's going to come from, but it it clearly could. I think it is going to be one of those things where I don't think Zach Moss plays in the Chiefs, the Rams, the Packers, but you maybe do make him active in a game against the Jets, the Bears, the Lions, where you think there's a higher probability of a four-minute offense situation. Um. But I'm curious. I don't know for sure. I think that Singletary and Moss are still a little bit more interchangeable, and Singletary is just the guy who's a little bit better, so he plays more. But if he goes down, it probably isn't that big of a drop-off to Moss because neither of them are super special. They're both pretty good. Um, I expect it to be Singletary and Cook active and more than half the season Zach Moss inactive. I think we see it pretty similarly. But, I mean, I think we can both concede that it's – really fascinating oh, to yeah. speculate oh, yeah. on and like i i can't wait to see it i i again i, I even don't mind the the if i could find the game day active spot for him i like that idea sure of using them in the three roles right it might it might be a linebacker spot i don't know dude like now you're gonna have me my head spinning trying to figure this out because like there is a there's a corresponding move that happens with dressing that third running back and I don't think it's going to be on the D line, you know. It's, it's is it the corner? Like, cause not they tip they kept six corners. Sometimes it's been five. Is Cam Lewis going to be inactive? Is Christian Benford going to be inactive? Oh boy! Well, well, remember <laughs> how many times did we go one short at corner and then somebody got nicked up early in the game and all of a sudden you're sitting there going, "Oh my god, we don't have another cornerback. What are you mm -hmm. guys doing?" I, you know, I, I don't know. And it's easy to do that at every single spot. You don't have a ton of in-game mm -hmm. depth at certain spots. Like it, it just is what it is. But I, I would rather, I don't think Zach Moss is that much better in short yardage or four minute drill than Devin Singletary, who's actually sneaky, decent in between the tackles mm -hmm. to then make a special teams contributor or depth defender inactive, in my opinion. Is there a, a concern offensively? Is there a concern, like a biggest concern for you about uh, what's in place and how things can play out? Um, I I think people should have high expectations. I think the floor is very, very high. From a concern standpoint, I, I, I'd be crazy not to have some concern about a learning curve and, you know, lessons learned for Ken Dorsey as a play caller. Um, I I've heard enough, uh, Tim Graham, you know, for his example, did some awesome, uh, articles on, how, you know, what kind of guy we're getting here about what an insane competitor and how well respected he is by everyone that, and I loved some of the stuff about there were plays that he couldn't call in other situations because he just didn't have an avatar as a quarterback who could accomplish <laughs> the things that he was dialing up these crazy plays. And we can't run that because there isn't a guy who can make those throws or do those things. And I'm like, oh my God, I'd love for him to find stuff that's like not physically possible for Josh Allen to do. That's going to be fun for him to to dial up. Um, so I'm 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 not worried or nervous, but 
he's never done it before. So, uh, you know, when you first go against, you know, Raheem Morris is a really good defensive mind and Bill Belichick and, but Mike Vrabel and like, he's going to have guys right off the bat that he's got to know what's going on. So I guess if I have a concern, it would be how quickly Ken Dorsey gets up to speed. Let's talk about the defensive side of the football. And I think we got to get to Trey white starting the season on the, the pup list. He'll, not be able to practice for four weeks, so he's eligible to start practicing after week four. Greg, I've said that I don't think he's back until week eight. You, you go through the first four games of the season, then you play the Steelers, you play the Chiefs, you have a bye, you play the Packers. People are mad at me for this, man, uh, and I feel like it's a completely reasonable expectation for what's going to play out. So what do, what do you say? I mean, are should fans be ready for Trey White against the Steelers in week five, or is uh, – Am I a little bit more on track with what you think reality is? I think yours is more likely. Um, I also, I don't think it's out of the question that he could practice that first week and play. My prediction is week six is that he practices week five and week six and plays against the Chiefs, knowing that he then gets a rest after his first game um, so that they get to kind of ramp him up, get him ready, and then dial it back and have some time and then go for the stretch run. Um it is very, very possible that they just play him from week eight on, which everybody has to remember, if he plays from week eight on, that's 11 games plus the playoffs. Like, I think people have it in mind that eight sounds like halfway, and just in with the way the bye is, and every, he's only missing six games. That means there's 11 other games. You're playing 11 games and the playoffs. That's still a lot. That's still great. That's still, a, you know, a ton of contribution to what the goals of this season are. So whether he play in, if in my prediction, it's he would play 12 games <laughs> and the best case scenario is he plays 13. So I think people feel like when you say eight, oh my gosh, the season's half over. What if we're in trouble by then? It's not, it's not as far away as you think. So I, I think that's a reassurance for people that I know week eight sounds forever, but it's still him playing 11 games mm -hmm. plus the playoffs. That's, that's totally fine. Um, and obviously this is where we need to see these investments in the defensive line contribute because no one's replacing Trey white. doesn't matter how well Dane Jackson, Kerry Elam or Christian Benford play. There is no replacing Trey white, but it doesn't mean they can't still be a successful defense that plays well with great safety help behind them, a top level slot corner, great coverage linebackers, and now a revamped defensive line who can get after the quarterback. And if you have, you know, athletic, capable, aggressive guys who will come up and tackle and the defensive line's getting there quicker, maybe they'll be less exposed. What else do you want to talk about with this defense? I mean, obviously, Trey White, I think, is the big story, but and, and in a way there, you kind of got to a lot in your response there, but is there any prevailing thoughts about this defense that maybe we didn't get to as part of that Trey White discussion that is, you know, weighing on your mind here as we're on the doorstep of the season? I'm trying not to go too overboard because I don't, want to just create a bunch of receipts that people come back and wave in my face. I really think we're going to see a special Tremaine Edmonds season. I do. I, I think that this is going to be a very reassuring season for fans, um, a very difficult season for his haters and doubters, <laughs> and a season where it turns the other way and fans are now upset. Oh my gosh, why didn't you lock him up earlier? Now he's going to cost way more money. Look, why, why did we wait to extend him and sign him? Um, I think that he's going to be able to step forward. I think having the pieces around him and especially the defensive line in front of him is going to make a big difference. And I think we're going to see a nice consistent season with more of the flash plays people want, but more consistent production from him. And I think it could be really positive. I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a money question for the bills. Like, and I, I don't not necessarily have a specific question. We heard Bean on Thursday morning say that, they have between 2.4 and 2.8 million dollars in cap space right now but as we set expectations uh, for in-season moves and the stability of the cap moving forward do you have any like general thoughts and things that we need to be aware of um i, I will say there isn't like a ton of extra space so every time someone asks about whether it's Odell Beckham Jr or whatever other pieces out there or you know when this just happened with the punters and you know going through that kind of situation there is an extra money. We, we've spent all the money. Um, there isn't going to be any money in these coming seasons that's extra, but they can still move stuff around. And they're going, what they started this year with void years, restructures, um, you know, future years with, er, with lower early caps. That's simply how it's going to work now. 
That's just how that is our new life. That is our new world. That is how this is going to work. So we just have to be ready for every season for the next, no exaggeration, five plus years is going to be similar to what the Saints have done. We're like, oh, hey, the Bills just restructured six players contracts and, you know, did the move their salary into a signing bonus and stretched out the money. Um, I already have four or six guys I have lined up for next year that are very, very likely to have that done. And I can create between 40 and 60 million dollars in cap space instantly. To be able to do that on um, that they may not leverage all of those to be able to do it but doing a handful of them they can do those and then extend dawson knox tremaine edmonds jordan poyer and ed oliver all four of them so all the different pieces that are there it doesn't mean we will at some point here we haven't seen it yet because we've only seen low-level guys harrison phillips levi wallace at some point we're going to have the actual comp pick situation where we let a major free agent go who signs elsewhere for big money but it doesn't have to start next year they really can restructure this and make it work and Bean set himself up well for the future uh last one for you uh we are literally in the immediate fallout of russell wilson and his extension with mm -hmm. the uh with the denver broncos and uh, didn't take long for Josh Allen to not even be a top five highest paid quarterback in the NFL. And while I think we can all celebrate the value <laughs> that, that exists with that contract, um, I, I guess I'm curious what analysis you might have to offer about Josh Allen's contract, restructure opportunities, the fact that Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow are going to get mega dollars next offseason, maybe even Lamar Jackson. Like how – what do you expect Brandon Bean's approach being with Josh Allen? And not that I think that Josh Allen's is going to be like a holdout or anything like that, but like making sure that he's paid according to his status in the NFL, but also the long-term cap viability and what all this means. Like, do you have any thoughts on that? I know it's, it's pretty a fresh deal based on us recording on Thursday afternoon, but what, what is, what do we need to be thinking about with all that? So, one, I think, I mean, it's a relative value. He's still got a huge chunk of money up front. He's still, I believe, going to get the second most cash of any player in the NFL this year. So he's still get, he's still doing really, really well. He Life is good for Josh Allen. He still has the second biggest contract in NFL history. Um, so it's still more than these other ones because he got another year. So his the only, the only contract that's bigger than $258 million in NFL history is Patrick Mahomes. That's it. It's still the second biggest overall contract in NFL history. So I think, yes, have some guys surpassed him from an AAV standpoint in the, the annual dollars? Yes. But I don't think it, and it's also 43 versus 45 versus 46. So I, I don't, if all of a sudden everybody else starts getting 55 or 60 and Josh is making 43, sure. Then all of a sudden it's like, hey, come on. But when it's, you know, hey, he's still getting more overall than them, but they're getting a little bit more per year. I don't have a concern there. As far as the contract that was structured, it was brilliant. The way that they built it every single year, Brandon Bean has a Josh Allen coupon mm -hmm. that he can simply say, well, do I want to convert this roster bonus into a signing bonus or do I want to convert this salary into a signing bonus and can create $25 million in cap space anytime he wants? And he will a multiple of those years. Um, and it makes no difference to Josh. He just gets a check for that amount of money. Either way, it may, there's no downside. It, it's perfectly good. And with a guy like Josh Allen, that there's no possibility that you're going to have to worry about what do we do if we have to release him. It's really a, a no-risk proposition to be able to do that. It's very, very smart the way they structured it. And he will be a big part of their cap flexibility going forward because it was intelligently uh, sponsored or uh, created. And I do think they built in some incentives there that he could get some other boosts if things go really well. So, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's a huge negative, but yeah, there is a possibility that on this day next year, he could be the eighth or ninth or 10th highest paid quarterback <laughs> in the NFL. Uh, so, you know, certainly was smart of being to strike while he did. Well, Greg, uh, you're an absolute pro. Uh, I guess probably 75% of the things that we talked about, I did not tell you we were going to talk about. You took it all in stride. You gave us a great conversation. We got smarter. We learned things. And I uh, just want to thank you for coming on and sharing your insight. Always a pleasure. It's one of my favorite uh, spots to be able to jump on. Thanks, Greg.
Uh, folks, this is not the last episode this week. Uh, I got a lot to talk about. The Bills signed a punter. They got a practice squad. We heard from Brandon Bean. Josh Allen had an interview with Chris Sims that has rocked my world. I got stuff to say. Uh, so on Friday morning, I'm going to record another podcast and get it to you probably on Friday afternoon, maybe maybe Saturday. I don't know. But there's another episode of Lockdown Bills coming for you this week. Uh, that's just how it goes. Uh, I can't sit on this stuff for the weekend. So we're going to get another podcast out to you this week. So make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to catching up with you again really soon.